This lecture will cover flannel boards, puppetry, and dramatization. So the objective of this lecture is to talk specifically about ideas for puppetry and flannel boards that you can use with children. We want to understand the importance of puppet play um, with children and teaching, te uh, teaching techniques for dramatization because ultimately when we have flannel boards and puppets that's um, a major reason why we use it and how we use it is so that we teach the children about dramatization and we give them many, many opportunities to um, act things out themselves. So flannel boards and activity sets are going to be the area that we're going to start with. You can see here an example of using a flannel board to describe the weather. Kids love flannel boards. They love to play with flannel boards. They love to help make pieces for flannel boards. And um, there are some quick and easy ways that you can use to have the kids help you and also to make them yourself. So flannel boards can be made with different shapes and designs. So uh, the most common example that you've probably seen the most frequently is covering, um, made by covering a sheet of heavy cardboard or display board or pre-stretched um, artist canvas or wood with a piece of solid color or, or wood of some kind with a piece of solid cover flannel or felt yardage. Felt is cheap. And so you can see in the pictures um, some examples of covering a canvas. I actually think one of the great ways to get um, a flannel board made is to purchase a canvas that nobody wants, like it's sitting in the you know bin at um, Walmart or Target or somewhere, and no one has thought that the scene was appealing. And you don't have to either, because if you're going to cover it with felt, it doesn't really matter at all what it looks like. Um, and then you can just staple on the felt, and, um, and lo and behold, you have a quick and easy felt board. Um, here's another example of a flannel board. You can see some of them have pockets. Um, the recommended size is around 24 inches to 30 inches. Much bigger, they start to get unwieldy and a little trickier to store. But, of course, they can be bigger or smaller, and they're used for a variety of reasons. And I would say there are many ways to get flannel boards um, made, not just you know, one piece of canvas like you saw in the previous slide, but other ideas that I've seen are taking um, a box, like a like a vegetable box and covering it on all four sides with felt um, and then what you can do is store pieces on the inside and then when it comes time to play you take the box you turn it upside down so that the opening is at the bottom or I guess it could be right side up but you could have four kids around that box all using the flannel board at the same time and then you have an easy place to store it. I've also seen um, Another idea, which is to take an old briefcase, you know those hardback briefcases that um, you know have a hard shell, and you can cover that with flannel, and um, then keep pieces on the inside. That's another um, strategy that you could use. In any case, they are you know so great to have in the classroom, and kids really love them. Children are really attentive when flannel boards are used because it gives them that one extra thing to look at instead of just hearing the story or instead of just looking at you. Um, and it also builds sequencing, which is a concept that you would talk about in math, science, and social studies for young children. And just, you know, sequencing is such an important concept, knowing what comes first and then after that and then after that and then last. So we use them for a lot of reasons. We use them to promote dramatic storytelling. We use them to teach um, important core concepts, and they're very effective. So the activity sets that we put on the felt board, we use to reinforce learning, whatever it is that we're learning about. So in that first slide, you saw a weather set. Here you can see rainbow fish. You can make these out of pellon and felt. They're low cost and durable. You can decorate pieces. It's really a great activity to give kids leftover felt scraps and say, why don't you make something for the felt board? They love to do that. And they can also make items out of cardboard as well. And then on the back of it, you just put a little piece of um, felt or a little piece of flannel, or you could put a Velcro button and, um, you know, like a little piece of Velcro. And then, you know, that's a really easy thing to do. So they don't have to be made out of fabric, um, if you know, as long as you're willing to put something on the back of it that will allow it to stick to your felt board. You can build lots of set ideas from books, stories, and themes. And as I mentioned, children will be so glad to participate if you say to them, oh, how about everybody make a rainbow fish that we can then use for the felt board and, 
Um, you'll get a lot of enjoyment out of that because then every time that set is out, they're like, well, I want to put my fish on the felt board too. And, and they just get really excited if they can participate in any way. And that's really the point that I'm trying to make is in terms of activity sets, giving kids that opportunity is really helpful. So presenting and using your felt pieces, um, make sure that you have everything in order, the correct sequence. It's a little bit anticlimactic if you're like, and the second pig ran to the house of, uh, where's my house of sticks? So just make sure if everything's in order, it's, it's just helpful. Take a quick minute to do that. If you have a really complicated story or a story you're unfamiliar with, you could even just practice it quickly before you start your day. Make sure that the pieces are all available, and by all means, have a storage system. So store them in folders, store them in little containers, little Ziploc bags, um, something that will make it easier. If you're going to use Ziploc bags, I recommend the one that has the actual little zip, the thing that you slide from one side to the other side that's a little bit easier for them to use. And I mentioned a minute ago the idea of using a vegetable box that's decorated on all sides with felt, and that is great. And when you store those pieces inside, you're going to want those pieces to be inside of another item just so that it doesn't, you know, you don't have your food pyramid mixed up with your weather, mixed up with your three little pigs, mixed up with rainbow fish. Um, it's just nice to try to keep things organized. And the kids can help you with that. That, that helps them practice classification and sorting and collections. So it's a good skill for them to help you keep that in working order. And if it's in working order and organized, then you'll feel more comfortable having it out and giving them opportunities to use it. Make it fun. So in terms of stories and activities, you can have teacher-made stories or commercially-made stories. You can make up a story. You can have the class help you make up a story. Um, sets can improve your listening skills and vocabulary, concept development. You, um, it gives us an opportunity to see visual shapes and images linked to the words and ideas that we're talking about as we're going through the story. And we can even use the flannel board to introduce stories. So maybe you want to start a unit on rainbow fish, and you, um, you, know, you start off with the book and the story, and it introduces that before you then go on to cover, let's say, the, the goal that you wished to cover. This is just um, an example of a flannel board. It's, as you can see, it's for Goldilocks. Um, and we see the three little pigs are on there, too. That's a commercially made one, it looks like. And um, there are lots of commercially made sets out there, although in this class you'll um, have the opportunity to make a flannel set that is not commercially prepared. And I do think that that's a good skill. So moving on into puppetry, puppetry um, helps us with a lot of the same things that flannel boards do. It really captures our interest and helps us to be creative and expressive. You learn how to be part of an audience. Um, puppets are great for motivating us to use oral language. So all those speaking and listening goals that we've been thinking about, that's so important because it gives you an opportunity to do that. You learn vocabulary and self-expression. People give puppets funny voices. They make puppets say funny things. So puppets are a great way to foster oral language in your classroom. Puppets are really important. They can help you um, teach about important, you know, civics concepts that you wanted to teach in terms of like rules or. Um, guidance and things like that. They can help you teach concepts that you want them to know. Let's say from, you know, how a, a flower grows from seed to flower. They, it can help you teach a lot of things. But very importantly, it does give children that opportunity to find a voice and express themselves, too. So um, one of the things that's really important in fostering oral language is to have your puppets be available. You want the kids to be able to present puppet plays and skits, to take advantage of the resources um, for puppetry in the community. That's something that you can do too. Ask parents if they want to come in and you know do little puppet things with the kids or invite the firefighters to come in and do a puppet safety show. You want kids to be exposed to puppets a lot. Um, and that means that you need to have them out. They need to be inviting. You need to um, keep them interesting by introducing different puppets every now and then. Oh, this is 
This is our winter puppet. We, oh, he only wakes up in the winter because he likes the cold weather. So just keep it interesting by having a rotation coming through and have those puppets be available. It, it kills me when I see puppets stored up at the very, very top, top of the classroom because it sends the message that they really aren't for the kids and they're not, you know, they're just not available. Here are some ideas for ways to store your puppet. So you can see um, on the top you've got, you, you know, you can put them in bins and keep them, um, you know, categorized in some way and keep them in, you know, cubby holders. You can see um, on the bottom right, you can see um, file folder organizers and they've each got a puppet in them. And then you can also see down underneath, you can see little hanging bags. Um, it looks like they're school supply bags that, um, have, you know, holes so that you can put them in a binder and you can just take little hooks, hanging hooks, um, and then put them, you know, in any kind of a hanging rod. And then over to the left, well, you can't see puppets in it, but anyway, that is something that, you know, you can do to store puppets, especially if you feel like there's a space issue in your classroom. You can just pick a door and put a shoe organizer, um, you know, on it and then um, store your puppets in that way. In terms of puppet activities, it's great to give children the opportunity to act out their feelings and emotions with puppets. It's a safe way for them to be like aggressive and you know you, in real life you can see the little girl in this picture, she's rawr. You can't, you know, we're, <laughs> we're not encouraged to do that to our friends. And, um, and to get that out in any way. But if you have a puppet on, it gives you an opportunity to, to let out different feelings. One of the things that I think is a really helpful thing to do with young children um, with vaccinations is to have a little puppet or a little doll that's like a vaccination doll. So in our family, we had vaccination Elmo. It's just a really small plush Elmo. And we put a Band-Aid on his arm, and he always went with us to vaccinations. And... Um, we had a little syringe, you know, those tiny little medicine, you know, we're giving medicine to infants, um, but it looks like a needle. And so whenever my kids would get a shot, we would um, give a shot to Elmo, too. And um, it was really interesting just to see them acting out their kind of motions, and they would kind of go through the whole thing. Oh, Elmo's getting a shot. It's okay, Elmo. Don't cry. You'll be okay. And puppets serve that same kind of function. They allow us to release our emotions. You could also have situations where the teacher can narrate actions for the children. Okay, now be like horses and grab your horse puppet or be animals at the zoo. Or You can do that. You can have children's puppets reply to a teacher's puppet so you can have a puppet conversation. Um, you can record simple puppet dramas with the kids. So there are many ways in which to use puppets. You can start off with just a little bit of an idea and see where it goes in terms of storytelling. That's a really great opportunity for them to practice that language and use their imaginations. Here are some examples of um, simple dramas, so reenacting life situations. Like I mentioned before, a lot of children have anxiety about going to the doctor. so any kind of puppet activities that they can do, um, you know, for things that are stressful for them are great. Pantomiming, um, is, that's a really helpful strategy to use. It's a foundation for preschool acting skills. You can just really acting that out, and um, that's a lot of fun for them. Creative drama, teachers can be co-participants with the children. You know what? They love it when we're silly. They love it when we get silly with them and when we participate in, our, in the silly stories. They just love that because it gives them permission to use their imagination if they see that we are willing to do it too. And you can also have problem-solving dramas. Like, oh, some of us are having trouble using our gentle hands with our friends and work that through sometimes with puppets that you can really open a window to try to see what it is that children are thinking. You can use books for drama. You can begin with a simple drama without props. You can read the book. You can announce the dramatization to come, like, okay, we're reading The Three Little Pigs. We read the book. Now we're going to act out The Three Little Pigs. You can select roles for the children or allow them to select roles for themselves. You can position children for rereading. So then you can go through it again and then reread. Like you see um, here in this one, this teacher is um, doing the wise old owl. So she's going to do a dramatization herself. And then a next natural step after that would be to allow the children 
to act it out. Even if not in circle, even if you say, when we go to centers, we're going to have the puppets out. And if you want to act out the story of the wise old owl, you'll have an opportunity to do that. Other tips for um, teacher puppetry. A pre-recorded dialogue is a good way to start. So if you are a little nervous or you feel like, oh, I'm a little, I'm just not practiced at this, um, you can practice at home or you can start with something pre-recorded and make your puppet talk along to something that's already recorded and is not you, and you'll get a little, hopefully, more comfortable. You can also develop a voice and personality for your puppet. So think about your puppet. Puppets um, can be very quirky. I have had puppets um, on my hand that don't like the rain. I've had puppets on my hand that really, really love to eat yogurt-covered raisins. Why? I don't know. It's just the quirk I picked for that particular time. I've had lots of funny voices for my puppets, and um, children really like it, actually, if a child, if, or I'm sorry, if a puppet has, um, like, like, some weird little quirks because it means that that puppet has personality. And since children are learning that quirks are really endearing about themselves, the things that they like, the things that they think are fun or interesting, it's really nice for them to see that reflected in a puppet. You can also practice. Practice with your puppet and coordinate your hand movements, especially if you feel a little nervous about it at the beginning. You can use a mirror for practice with the puppet, especially if you have one tricky little part or you really want to make a special point in one part of your story or in one part of the lesson that you're teaching. And using books for drama um, are, are great. You can reread the story and prompt the children while reading the story and encourage, encourage audience participation. So what do you think, Brown Bear, what do you think happened next? What else did we see? And then, you know, allow the children to chime in because they know the story. You've probably, you know, you've read it before. You've already introduced it. Maybe you've got a, a flannel board set and they've acted it out. They know it's coming next. You want to give them the chance to say what's coming next. And the development of dramatization in general, when you do plays, whether it involves puppets, whether you start off with flannel boards, or whether you're doing it with a flannel board, or whether you're just human characters, um, dram dramatizing is really a great thing to do to help foster that oral literacy. So dramatizing story involves listening, auditory memory, visual memory, remembering sequences of events, and audience skills. You learn all of those things when you are any part of drama. You, you know, you have to learn, okay, well, I can't have my back to the audience and speak because then they can't hear me. You, um, you learn how to be part of an audience. You learn how to listen to the other person as they share their dialogue. All of this is really great for fostering these skills. Drama for older children, they can pantomime things like the meanings of words. That's a little bit more sophisticated, like pantomime hungry. Um, that, that can be, that's what we mean when we say pantomime meanings of words. You can act out life situations and familiar characters. You can make story sequence cards so that you can practice things like beginning, middle, and end. Using props and staging is great. Keep props and staging simple. You know, it doesn't have to be perfect. Children have great imaginations. You can have just easy things. You know, uh, putting a vest on can maybe very easily turn you into a sheriff or, um, a, you know, a cowboy or an opera singer. I mean, it really, just little things can can provide that sense of transformation for kids. Paper plate masks are about the easiest thing in the world if you are looking for ways to engage in dramatization. Cardboard cutouts are great too. And you can see some examples here in terms of staging. You have one where it's like a, you know, a, a trifold kind of area that's been set up. You can see here's the back of a couch. So you can have children help make something and make it really elaborate. They cut out in the trifold, they cut out a window, and then it looks like they put some fabric and they have it tied back with ribbons. So it can be elaborate, but it doesn't have to be. Here are some other examples. Um, here's a box. That red one is a box that um, the kids painted or the adult painted, and then they just, you know, they cut out a hole. I'm not sure exactly how big the box is. It doesn't look like a refrigerator box, so it looks more like, 
you know, a really big box that, you know, probably something came in, not bigger than a coffee maker, but um, not as hard to find necessarily as a refrigerator box. And if you ask parents, hey, if anybody's got any big boxes coming in, if you could let me know, then that's great. And then over here on this other one, this is just fabric with a hole cut out. So it looks like the fabric was pinstriped, and if it wasn't, maybe they just took a Sharpie and drew lines down, you know, very simple, cheap fabric, and then um, it's fastened up at the top. It looks like it's not even a permanent type of fastening. It looks like there's string or ribbon holding it up, and, you know, maybe even just put on two small nails up at the top of the, of the door sill. It doesn't need to be super fancy. So in terms of final thoughts, I would say this. I would say that every opportunity that you give children to use puppets, flannel, um, or to engage in any kind of, of drama, dramatization, that's an opportunity for those children to learn that they have a voice and that people will be interested in hearing that voice, that they can, that they can have a little moment on the stage and that other people will want to hear what they have to say. This is invaluable in fostering our oral language skills, our, our sense of self-esteem, which also in turn then allows us to feel that we can express ourselves, and it's um, a key element of promoting oral literacy.